word. Father, we thank you again today. Now, Lord, for the opportunity to be here one more time. Lord, for the opportunity. Yes, Lord, even the privilege. What a privilege it is that we have to come to church and to be here with God's people. Father, I thank you for our, 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 our fellowship here, Lord. And Lord, I know I call it ours, but I, and I, but I know it's yours. I know that. Lord, we're not trying to grab anything from you. Lord, we know it's your fellowship, but Lord, we thank you for our place here in Greg, New York. And Lord, we pray today again that you would meet with us in the few minutes we have. Lord, really, we, we are not here very long on Sunday morning, and then we're going to be gone. And Lord, again, Father, I pray again for this uh, dear man, Mr. Humphreys, Lord, down in Alabama, uh, crushed by a runover, backed into, I'm not sure what happened other than that he's been severely injured by a semi, and Lord, we want to lift him up to you today, and Father, we pray for him. Lord, we pray again for that family, and Brother Fugit's church where the dad was killed, and three boys, I believe, were killed, and Lord, terrible. But, Lord, I, I, I can't help but believe that you, Lord, I know, Lord, we just must by faith believe that someday we will know why these things happen. We cannot, I can't explain it other than that, Lord, I know that you know best. Father, we pray for those today that are in such need. Lord, the people all around us, I think of the lady up the street, uh, Laurie Crewaks, Lord Cricks, father with cancer, and Lord not doing well. Lord, how many people do we know? Just sick, some terminally. Father, I, I thank you again for, uh, Lord, allowing us to come to your, into your presence that we might bring these names before the throne of grace today. And, Lord, we ask your, your blessing and, and Lord, your, your help and, Lord, your healing, Lord. Lord, we pray. We ask again that you'll meet with us in the few minutes that we have. Lord, meet with us. We pray for the presence of God. And we pray also for the power of God. Lord, we ask that you come down and meet with us today. Meet with us, we ask. Please meet with us. Lord, encourage us today. Help us, we pray. Lord, in these few minutes that we have, they are only a few minutes. And Lord, bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. He was over to talk about Mr. Jack. Oh. The Jacks who slipped off the truck and could not sit around. But his friend was right there with him as they were getting off the money. Okay. If you didn't hear that, which is a, a good practical lesson, but this man was under a truck with a jack, just a jack, and the jack slipped out and the truck fell on him. And so uh, you might remember him. Named Ralph Humphrey from Alabama. So I wonder how hot it is in Alabama today. And you didn't want to move there. But anyway, so all right. So we get started today. Anybody got a question today? If you have a question, we'll try and answer it. If not, I've got lots of stuff to say. Anybody got a question? Going once. Going twice. All right. Look, if you would, at Romans chapter 6. We'll start there today. Romans 6. We did finish Galatians last week. I've got to step back. I've got to get a pair. Huh. How about that? pair of glasses that are going to break, that have been set on. It isn't funny. Romans chapter 6. Don't laugh at him. Because that only eggs him on. Romans chapter 6. 
I know that looks really goofy, but at least I can. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to go home and watch Charles Stanley. But uh, I appreciate very much this. I'm going to say this. I appreciate very much uh, people's confidence in me. I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything. Although Haley told me just a little while ago that I know everything. So, uh, but uh, she's a smart little girl. But uh, it's like I appreciate people's confidence in me. And, and Deb gave me a book this week. She asked me to look at it and see what I thought about it. And it didn't take too long before. When you're reading, you need to be, as you read, you need to take note of what you're reading. I read a book by a Jehovah's Witness one time, and I'm reading along, reading along. I know it was by, a, if it's got New World Translation, and if it got Kingdom Hall, you know it's Jehovah's Witness. But my father-in-law gave me this book, asked me to read it, and I'm reading along, reading along, reading along. And I read this line, that sometime in eternity past, God created Jesus. And I'm still reading along. And I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I went back and read it again. Sure enough, that's what it said, that in eternity past, God created Jesus. Now, the truth of the matter is God did not create Jesus. Jesus has always been. He is eternal. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And I believe verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so when you're reading, you need to be careful. There are some telltale signs. Again, if it says New World Translation or if it says Herald Press. Yeah, that Herald. And that's Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventist really, Seventh-day Adventist would like to be considered to be normal. And they, as with a lot of cults, and let me say this about cults, that cults, a lot of cults, have s some amount of truth. You can find some amount of truth in just about any of them. And the Seventh-day Adventists have some truth in them. But they have so much error. They do not believe in eternal hell. They, 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 have, they believe in the writings of Ellen G. White, that she had these visions uh, and... They're totally out in left field, and they are called Seventh Day. They, they, like many false cults, they believe that the Sunday, worshiping on Sunday, is the mark of the beast. That anybody who worships on Sunday, uh, that's what it is. And so I was reading this book that Deb gave me, and I'm reading along and reading along. I, I guess... Yeah, look back at, hold your place there, but look back at Mark 16, because this is the verse that caught my attention when I was reading. In Mark chapter 16, you, you realize this, that when the devil came to Eve, remember what God said? God said, the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall what? Surely die. You shall surely die. That's what God said. But that's not what the devil said. He said in Genesis chapter 3, ye shall not surely die. Just that three-letter word changed the truth of God into the lie of the devil. Because God didn't say, that you'll not die. Satan says, you shall not surely die. God knows that if you eat of it, your eyes will be open, know both good and evil. And God said, uh, and the devil said, no, that, that's not it. So I'm reading in this book, and in Mark chapter 16, it says in verse uh, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now read that again. He that believeth and is baptized shall not be saved. Now, I'm reading this book, and, and I, I see this. 
he said, the, the same three-letter word that Satan put in, this guy says this, it, the devil puts in, he said, the not. And when you read that verse, he that believeth and is not baptized shall be saved. Now, this guy, I, I figured out pretty quick, this guy was a Church of Christ guy. Now, the Church of Christ and other groups like them believe in this, this term, baptismal regeneration. Remember, what is baptismal regeneration? Who knows, what is baptismal regeneration? What is that? Okay. Salvation by baptism. That's what it means. They believe, and there are other groups like them that believe that you must be baptized in order to be saved. And so when you read that verse 16, it says this, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now I said a couple weeks ago that the whole Church of Christ philosophy is built on four verses. The verse in here, the verse in John chapter 3, the verse in Acts chapter 4, uh, or Acts chapter 2, and then there was one other verse, I, I remember, oh, oh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Uh, I forget, 1 Peter 3, 21. Somebody look up 1 Peter 3, 21 for me real quick, and, uh, and when you get it, raise your hand. But uh, they build their whole doctrine on being baptized to be saved. Yes, go ahead. Like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. All right, stop right there, because that's where they stop. Because where if the like figure whereunto baptism also doth save us, and that's where they stop with that. But that isn't where the verse stops. Read the rest of it. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God right. by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. So before we look at Romans six. You know, baptism, everybody ought to be baptized. If you've been saved, you ought to be scripturally baptized. You say, well, what do you mean by scripturally? Well, the word bap baptizo, baptized, means to, make, to dip, to make fully wet, to immerse. That's what the word baptize means. Randize means to sprinkle. Bap Randizo means to sprinkle. Baptizo means to immerse. That's why we believe in immersion. But look at Romans chapter 6. See, not only do they believe that a person is saved by baptism, but again, that where, where Beth just read, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Baptism does not wash away our sin but is merely the, the answer of a good conscience toward God. What is baptism? Baptism is, is something that people do that signifies to those on the outside what has happened on the inside. What's happened on the inside? I got saved. My sins are gone. They've been, our sins have been washed according to what first. Or Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, who washed us from our sins in his own blood. Titus 3, 5, uh, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration. Now again, you can take that, oh, well, right there, preacher. But there's so many verses we can look at. Romans, I said Romans chapter 6. Not only do they, and I'm going to look at Titus 3, 5 in a moment, but Romans chapter 6, not only do they believe that your sins are washed away by being baptized, but they also believe this. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also 
we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, they also believe this, that a person is not joined to Christ until they are baptized. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at that one for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Say, well, what about, and I'll ask you this, well, what about a person who gets saved and never gets baptized? Well, we could ask the thief on the cross that question. And there have been multitudes of people who have been baptized over the years. Now, should you be baptized? If you absolutely you should be baptized if you have the opportunity. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. I've said before, I do not believe in what is called the universal church. I do believe in the, in the universal body of Christ. I think you're pretty hard-pressed, I really believe this, I think you're pretty hard-pressed not to prove, not to say that there is a universal body of believers. That everybody who is saved, everybody who is saved, has been baptized into the body of Christ. We are in the body of Christ. Now the church, the, Bible, the New Testament, the New Testament, I believe there are 113 references where the word church is used. And all but two of them refer to a local New Testament church. Or refer to a church. Something that's local. I'm not for, well, I belong to the universal church and I don't have to go to church because I belong to the universal church. Though you may belong to the universal body. When we get saved, when we get saved, several things happen. We're not going to go into that today. Several things happen when you and I get saved. But one of them is that we are baptized immediately into the body of Christ. That we are, uh, we become a, a joint heir with Christ at that point. That we are part of the body of Christ. We don't have to wait for physical baptism. Again, physical baptism does not save us. Now, if you stop and think about it, we're big ones on grace here. We kind of like that philosophy, that idea. It's either grace or works. And I'm not going to use my favorite verse, but it's either grace or works. Now, if you say that you must be baptized to be saved, it absolutely, John, it becomes a means, it becomes a means, and, and hear, hear me, if you say you have to be baptized to be saved, baptism becomes a means of grace. You have now negated the death of Christ. Because, well, well, I believe Jesus is necessary, but I do not believe he's sufficient. Therefore, I must be baptized in order to go to heaven. And brethren, we simply know that that is not true. That you can pull a verse here and a verse there. They want to use Romans 6, 4 and, and say this, that in verse 4 particularly, that for we have been, I forget it, let me, I've got to read it again. In Romans 6, 4, I forgot what it was, but uh, being baptized, there it is. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead. They want to use that verse. They want to use that verse to say, see, we are not joined to Christ until we have been baptized. But the glorious truth is that once we have trusted Christ and have invited him to come into our heart, we are immediately joined together with him and become a joint heir. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. Paul Paul is unique in using the term in Christ. In Christ. I ask you this question. I think you know the answer. How long does it take to get saved? How long does it take to get saved? Split second of time. Absolutely. Salvation is not like a drawn-out process. Now, it may be drawn out in this way 
You may hear the gospel and not be saved, and then hear the gospel and hear the gospel, and eventually it brings conviction to your heart, and then you trust Christ. But in trusting Christ, when you trust Christ, it is like, boom, immediate. When, when children are born, they always give the minute that they're born. And so it is with Christ. When you and I are saved, salvation occurs instantaneously. And, man, we are saved. And not only are we saved then, but we are saved for all eternity. How many have been saved? Let me ask this. How many have been saved? Uh, I'm trying to ask this. How many were saved as kids? Anybody saved as kids? All right. Very good. How many were saved as adults? Anybody saved? Okay. Saved as adults. Okay. Now, those people that were saved as kids, I'll, I'll say it like this. You can do your very level best to raise your kids the right way. Make sure they're in church, and et cetera, et cetera, but... Sometimes they choose to go their own path. Does that make you happy? No. Are you glad? No. My, one of my teachers in school, Dr. Chapman, was a great guy. All he was was just an old Baptist preacher that they hired to teach Bible classes at Liberty. Dr. Chapman said this one time. He said, I've known a lot of people who were saved. They got away from God. But he said, I've never known anybody that was saved. They got away from God. that didn't eventually come back to God. And John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 kind of proves that out. However, having said that, if you get away from God, I don't care whether you're a kid or whether you're an adult, if you get away from God, are you still saved? Yes. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely you are. Because we are, he that hath the Son has what? Anybody know that? Life. What kind of life? Eternal. Eternal life. If you have the Son. And I know people always want to argue, well, what if you lose him? <laughs> My one brother, God bless him. I love the guy. But, he really believes that you can lose him. I don't know how you can lose him. Because he was looking for us. We weren't looking for him. He was the good shepherd. We were that one little lost lamb that had gone astray. And he went looking for us. If anybody's going to get lost, it's not going to be the good shepherd. But bless God, he came looking for us and he found us. And brought us back to the sheepfold. Sometimes, you know, the sheep wander. But we're still the sheep. We're still the sheep. I, I can tell you this. I'll tell you this about the Church of Christ. <laughs> Brother Dewey likes to get on the radio. The Church of Christ are big down south. They're not very big up here. The Church of Christ are big down south. And they're on the radio, and Brother Dewey likes to get on there with them once in a while. And, because Church of Christ believed that you, you can sin and lose your salvation. So Brother Dewey got on there one day with, his guy's name is Wesley. And he just said, Wesley, have, have uh, you ever sinned? He goes, well, I don't think so, not after I got saved. So then Brother Dewey asked him a question. He asked him a question about adultery, about lusting after me. You ever done it? Well, yeah, I guess I have. He goes, well, were you lost? Well, now he preaches that you can lose your salvation if you sin. Thank God that God doesn't save us based upon how good we can live after we get saved. If I were to ask this morning, because I was thinking about this this morning, how many people in here have messed up since You've been saved. Well, man, mine would be the first hand up. Everybody messes up. But we have been joined to the body of Christ 
Look at first or Ephesians chapter. I didn't mean to go down this road, but let me just go over here to Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one. Let me just give you this verse real quickly. Ephesians chapter one. Now, again, I want to say this. Because we are eternally saved, that does not give us permission, that nor does it give us the right. Nor I, I think actually give us the the, the want to. I again know I'm, tr I'm drawing a fine line because there are Christians. I've said this so many times, and I, I, I know sometimes we're redundant on this thing, which means so many times, but uh, I know that Christians get away from God. I know that. You mean real born-again, blood-washed Christians? Absolutely. They do. Uh, Kim. What if someone is saved and then something happens, they get amnesia and they forget about it and they are a self-proclaimed atheist? Okay. All right. Matt. One second. One second. You can answer it. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to answer it. Go ahead. Has it happened? Has it ever happened? <laughs> that's, that's. Okay, but let's see, let me, okay, so I'm going to put it like this. All right, Matt. Where's your mother? Where's your mother? Right there? Is that your mother? Okay, I can tell you she probably is because she was there. All right, Matt. You get hit on the head by a golf ball out on the golf course. You now have amnesia, and you say, BJ is my father. <laughs> BJ is your father. <laughs> now, Matt says BJ is his father, and Danielle is his mother. The truth of the matter is, who is your mother? You're right. Doesn't matter. But, you know, that question. <laughs> We're going on. But it's like, I know people, I know of people, I know of people. Let's put it like this. Let's think about Pete's dear wife, Irene, and you know people like her. Irene didn't even know her own name when she died. She didn't know who Pete was. She, she didn't. I wonder people like that, you wonder is there any, and I don't mean this in a bad way, is there any brain activity whatsoever in which they are, are aware of what's even going on around them? Are they even able to think? But I can tell you this, when she died, she's still a, a, a daughter of the king. She may not have remembered it. She, she, may not, she could not tell you the day. She couldn't tell you her name. She didn't even know how to eat. But I'll guarantee you she was still a daughter of the king when she died. Why? Because the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness everything when we put our trust in him Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 we better back up just a little bit and and Matt if you're not careful I'm gonna have daddy take you out take care of you so anyway <laughs> verse 13 and whom also ye trusted who is in whom the in whom is Christ, verse 12, who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted, trusted in Christ, after that ye heard the word of truth. You can't be saved apart from the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of 
All right, so you've got to have the Word of God. Somebody out there says, well, I think you can be saved by nature. No, you can't. You may realize that there is a God. You may know, and the Bible says that all things, uh, the things of God are clearly seen in Romans chapter 1. So that they are without excuse. Nobody has an excuse for not being saved. I'm telling you that people who die and go to hell go there because they choose to go there. Not because they have to go there. Because God in heaven has done everything possible for a person to be saved short of making them get saved. So we heard the word of God. You may realize you're a sinner. I knew that. But it wasn't until someone explained to me through the word of God, what is it, Romans 5, 12, wherefore is by one man sinner in the world and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we are sinners, Christ died for. Let's take out that plural pronoun and put in the, the singular that Christ died for me. I realized that Christ had died, but I didn't know he died for me. See, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. All right, so after we heard the word of God, we trusted the gospel of your salvation, the good news, in whom also after that ye believe. All right, after we heard the word of God, we trusted, after we believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. All right, when you and I got saved, I said one thing that happened to us, we were baptized into the body of Christ. A spiritual baptism by the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ. Now, we ought to have a physical baptism where, bless God, if you've been saved, I can't, I, and I might be preaching to the choir, you know, everybody ought to get baptized. If you're saved, everybody ought to get baptized. And again, somebody else say to me, now, I, I'm not a landmark Baptist. You say, what are landmark Baptists? They believe that another church's baptism, even if you were immersed in another church, is no good. They have to be immersed in their church for it to be good. I don't believe that. Somebody came to me and said, Preacher, I've been saved and I've been baptized and I'd like to join your church. I say, well, bless God. Uh, you got a blank check? Give it to me. Come on down. You can join church. Amen. It's like that. Everybody ought to be baptized. Everybody. Now, afterwards, when we're saved, we are baptized by the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ. Now, it says there in that verse, when you and I got saved, there was a divine seal put on our life by the Holy Spirit of God. Notice what it says, which is the earnest. A, an earnest is... A pledge. It's like most of you, most, I didn't see everybody. When you got engaged, ladies, did you get a diamond ring, a rhinestone ring, a cracker jack ring, a ring of some kind? When you got engaged, probably, probably, you got a ring. What was that ring? That ring was an earnest. That was a pledge. And, and really, women have taken men to court who have broken that pledge. That ring was a pledge that you were going to get married. That wasn't a divine pledge, but that was a, okay, here's a token of how much I love you, and here's the diamond ring, and, and you know, let's get married, and you know, they go around, show it off, et cetera. And guys don't get that. It's because men don't think like women. Do you, <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> but women's, women's brains are wired differently than men. They really are. Every... Uh, Everything to a woman, everything to a woman is connected. It's all, everything's connected. 
That's why women remember everything. Everything is connected, and it's connected by emotion. Easy, easy now, come on. It connected by emotion, but that, you know. You really want a diamond ring? Really? I gotta buy you a diamond ring to get married? If you wanna get married, you do it, but anyway. So it's like this, notice what it says, which is the earnest of our inheritance, which is the pledge of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession. That seal is on my life until the day that I will be redeemed, whether by death or by Jesus coming. That mark, that seal, which is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is that seal, that earnest that was given to me until the day that I am redeemed. And when I am redeemed, then that seal will be broken. But only until then. And there is nothing in the Bible. Oh, I know, like the Church of Christ, like the Church of Christ, you can find verses that would, you know, say, well, that verse seems to indicate you can lose your salvation. Or that verse seems to indicate you could lose your salvation. Or that verse indicates. You can find a verse here. Or they always like to use Judas Iscariot. They say, look, Judas was one of the disciples. Yeah, he was. Judas was one of the. And for three and a half years, three, three and a half years, he traveled with Jesus. Saw all the miracles. Saw everything that Jesus did. But in the end, say, see, preacher, he was saved and lost. Wait a minute. No, no, wait a minute. Was Judas ever saved, yes or no? No, he was not. Judas, and, and, and if you think, well, Judas was saved, but then was lost, that isn't what Jesus said. Jesus said, have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? When he gave him the sop, I always find this somewhat amazing or somewhat puzzling. The disciples all began to ask, Lord, who is it? They, they actually began to, Lord, is it I? He said, one of you is going to betray me. And he, they said, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? Jesus said, whosoever dippeth his hand with me in, with a sop, I might be wording that wrong, but I know the sop, sop morsel of bread, who dipped with it. Jesus dipped the bread and gave it to Judas, and the Bible says, and the devil entered into Judas, and he went out. But I find, here's, the disciples thought he went out to make ready for something. When Jesus had clearly said that, whosoever dips his hand with me is he. They, they, didn't, they didn't understand it. They didn't get it. And they were with him. But anyway, so Judas was not saved. He wasn't saved. Now, I know that there are people who say, well, he was saved. You can't prove that from the Bible. Well, he traveled with Jesus. This, this, I don't think things happen by coincidence. What is the mark of the beast? What is the mark of the beast? 666. At least we think it is. And the verse that is so telling is John 6, 6, 6. John 6 and verse 66. And from that time, many of his disciples turned and walked no more with him. You say, preacher, do you think they were saved? I don't know. I have no idea. It's like anything else. Look, we're trying to throw out the lifeline, and we're trying to get as many people saved as we possibly can. You say, preacher, does everybody that prays a prayer, does that mean they're saved? No. Of course not. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans 10. Romans 10. And that always bothered me. Somebody said, well, yeah, not everybody prays a prayer saved. And you read Matthew, I believe it's chapter 7. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. I said, well, man, I've called upon the name of the Lord. I said, more of that's talking about me. And I remind you again that if you'll read those verses in Matthew, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, and they will say, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? 
Have we not cast out demons on it? And have we not done? And that word right there is the word that explains everything. Have we not done? Many wonderful works. Done. Salvation is not by done, other than the fact that it is done when Christ did it. See, what they're doing is do. If you're in here and told me this, I would, I'm trying to remember who told me this. Somebody told me this. I, they, I think they told me yesterday or the day before. I was out here. I'm trying to remember who it was. If, and if you told me this, I, I apologize. I just don't. Said that hell is full of good people. Because we did. Didn't we do all this stuff? Hell is full of good people. Moral people. The Pharisee, I wish I could tell you again where this was in Luke. I know it's in Luke. I'll narrow it down to that. The Pharisee stood up, said, God, I thank you. I'm not like John. I fast twice in a week. I give a tenth of all that I possess. I am not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not an extortioner. The publican would not lift up his eyes. just said, Lord, be merciful to me. I said, there's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. Sure there is. The publican just prayed it. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what a sinner's prayer is. Lord, be merciful to me. Jesus said this. I'm telling you that that publican went down justified and not that righteous hypocrite. I'll say again. Not a, see, preacher, our only... Are only the Baptists going to heaven? Of course not. Did one of you say that to me? Their hell is full of good people. There's somebody, somebody, maybe I dreamed it, but uh, where, where are we at? We're in Romans chapter 10. Notice this. And this is important. Verse 9. That if thou shalt profess with thy mouth, Lord Jesus, notice, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. How long does that take? Just like that. You realize how easy it is to be saved. I said this a few minutes ago. God Almighty has done everything he possibly can to get a sinner saved. Short of saving. All you got to do. How many times have I said it? All you got to do is ask. Now, is everybody that prays a prayer saved? No. But verse 9 is, I think, kind of clear. And again, as I've said repeatedly, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, the two clearest verses, I believe, in the New Testament on salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth. Hey, who's saved today? Amen. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Brother Curtis always should say this. I, I, don't, know, I don't know whether it's totally true, but I think in a a large, probably to some degree it might be. He always said that if a person raised their hand for prayer and then the invitation was given, that he believed that the person, when they walked out of the aisle to come forward to trust Christ, was probably already saved when they came forward to trust him because they, they, they realized they were a sinner, realized maybe they didn't know what to pray, maybe they came forward and they prayed and asked the Lord to save them, but they were by faith stepping out Again, walking down an aisle doesn't save anybody. That doesn't save anybody. But believing in your heart does. Believing there. 
for where the heart man believes on the righteousness. And so there are a lot of people who believe in Jesus. I, we sure got off the baptism thing today, but anyway. Uh, so where the heart man believes on the righteousness and where the mouth confession is made. If a person is saved, I believe that they will confess it. I think they will. However, again, I'm not trying to throw a caveat in there, but however, when Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea came after Jesus died, the Bible says that he craved the body of Jesus, but he believed in Jesus, but secretly, he was a secret believer. Are there people who are saved that we may not be? Yeah, probably. I'm telling you that any person was willing to realize. Now, when you read verse 9, I think there's more to that verse than meets the eye. Not a whole lot more, but here's, why would a person, now think about this for a minute. Why would a person call upon Christ? Why would a person call upon Christ? Anybody got an answer to that? Why would a person call upon Christ? Why? Why would he do that? Why did you do that? Huh? Have a need. Call upon Christ to save us because we realized that we were lost. Why would a person call upon Christ if they didn't know they were lost? It, why? why how, what's that, Arnold? They won't. Absolutely. So when you read verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... Your understanding at that point, man, I'm lost. I know. Now, who told me? He did. The guy that just walked in. I knew I was out there working on that, and somebody out there said that to me. I couldn't remember that. What happens when you get old, amen? But, but it's like, when you read that verse... That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Why would anybody call upon Christ to save them unless they realize that they were lost? And then they'll call. I, I've, I believe in repentance. Repentance is simply a change of mind. Now it will lead to a change of action. I guarantee you that. But before I was saved, what do I need Christ for? What do I got to be saved for? I don't need to be saved. Why do I got to be saved? Truth be told, I didn't even know what saved meant. I really hadn't even, I'm trying to remember. I said at one time I heard my uncle preach some sermon, probably to my father, but because my dad wasn't saved at the time, but I didn't know what the word saved meant saved but when we realize that we are lost and we have a need then we are willing to call upon Christ that Jesus will save us so you got to be careful what you read that was my whole point on that book that Deb gave me be careful what you read I love to read I, I'll read just about anything uh, I, I love to read I'll read it, but you've got to be careful what you read because there are a lot of false people that are out there that would lead you astray from Christ. So, anyway. All right, anybody got a comment? Anybody got a question? Anybody got an idea? Other than the amnesia thing? Brenda? What you said about silent believers, you've met my father. Right. Um, he never would get saved or anything. So would you think it's possible that he did, but out of his stubbornness, just kept it to himself? I know when I get to heaven, I'll know for sure. You know, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you on that one. Uh, let me ask you this question. I'll ask this question. They always tell you if you're in an argument, you don't know the answer to it, answer it with a question. So, okay. Are you saved today? You saved today? Me and John are saved today.
You going to heaven, pal? Amen. If you don't turn that phone off, you're not. But anyway, I'm just kidding you. But anyway, it's like, uh, it's like, oh, Bonnie's watching us. Everybody turn around the camera, wave hi to Bonnie. But uh, so it's like, uh, Brenda, to answer your question, I, I honestly believe that if a person is saved, I, I'll, I'll say it like, I'll put it like this. I read Charles Ryrie's book, and Ryrie was a really good guy. One of the best books I ever read on grace was by Ryrie. And here's the thing about Ryrie is that he was a Presbyterian. Can you imagine that? A safe, no, no, there are a lot of safe presidents. Yeah. J. Wilbur Chapman, who wrote that song, One Day When Heaven Was Filled With His Praises, was a Presbyterian. Billy Sunday was a Presbyterian. Bob Jones was a Methodist. Sam Jones, look. But Charles Ryrie said this. If a person is saved, there's something different on the inside. There is something different on the inside. You may not always see it. But God is doing something on the inside. I, I'm not sure if I totally agree with Ryrie on that, but I take comfort in that, Brenda, and saying that maybe your dad was saved and he just never said it. But here's my thing. If John, and I, we're not getting one to get rid of John, are we? No. Hey, let me say we got one of those clear things in the back. So anyway, if I'm standing over your coffin at your funeral, I don't care whether it's John or Alex, anybody, don't leave me wondering. Don't leave us wondering. Boy, I wonder if he made it. Boy, I don't know. He never said whether he was going or not. Now, John gives testimony to it. So we're going to rejoice if he were to go or Pete were to go. We're going to rejoice. Are we going to be sad? Yeah, for a little while. Yeah, we, we have to stop. I'm sorry. We we're out of time. If somebody dies, if John were to die, I would truly miss him. But I have every confidence that we shall meet again someday. You say, why is that? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's so simple. It is. It's just so simple. That people, some, we, gotta, we have to stop. Father, we thank you again for another day. Thank you again, Lord, for your mercy and your grace to us. Lord, thank you for loving us. Love so amazing, so divine. Thank you that we are sealed. Lord, we sure covered the whole ballpark this morning. But Lord, we're so thankful today for your wonderful grace. Lord, bless, we pray, our church and our people. Oh, God, oh, God, do a work, we pray, here in Greg, New York. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.